الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم A few days ago I was asked probably the best question I've heard in months at uh, a panel I was participating in A Muslim mother said what can we do to help our children defend themselves against the constant verbal attacks on their identity what can parents do to help their children our children when they are facing name calling bullying and microaggression on a daily basis at their schools for no other reason than because they are muslims and while this question in and of itself warrants an entire lecture there were really two things that we offered this parent when she asked this question one is to give them the intellectual tools to deconstruct the mental framework that is flawed and crooked that makes up the ideas of islamophobia because they are not sound ideas or built on any rational arguments so to equip our children with the ability to deconstruct it at least for themselves so it doesn't enter their own hearts and the second thing that we offered is to teach our children that their roots in this country run deep that this is their country and no one has the right to tell them otherwise that no one should be waiting for a welcome to their own house so if someone has a problem with our children being here then they are free to go back to where they came from and this is not just mere rhetoric these are historical facts that many of us are not aware of now i am i feel a little insecure and intimidated by this topic since i am myself not a historian but i've collected my favorite stories to share with you today these are stories that inspire me about the history of muslims in america and how muslims have shaped america but i encourage you to do your own reading and to actually talk to real historians and learn more because i am only scratching the surface i am just wetting your appetite to learn more and make this a priority in your in your own discussions in your sunday schools and even in the public school system where you might be involved encourage them to include american muslim history as a part of american history Before I jump into some of these stories that inspire me, I want to explain one more thing, and that is the importance of a community having a shared history and being aware of its shared history. Because a shared history shapes our concept of ourselves, shapes our perception of our role shapes our identity roots us in our society as citizens as partial owners helps us take a stake 
take our stake in the place that we call home, and it shapes our future. If we don't have a shared history in our country, if we don't know that shared history, it makes it that much harder to create a shared vision for the future. So this isn't just about the past. This is about the future. Historians have documented Muslim interaction and engagement with the Americas dating back before Christopher Columbus, with Moorish explorers, with Portuguese Muslim explorers, with Chinese Muslim explorers. In fact, I was so inspired and amazed to learn when I actually was in Beijing at a museum in China where a, you know, a government uh, tourist uh, tour guide was explaining that Chinese people, uh, you know, reached the Americas before Columbus, which is actually, of course, a fact. And they had a replica of the boat, and they explained how, how it worked. And then they talked about the captain, or one of the captains on the boat, and they actually had like a, almost like a statue of him. And they explain, and this is the tour guide in this Chinese museum, said that this man was in fact a Muslim. So I didn't just hear it from a book that I read here in the United States. I heard it directly from the Chinese who confirmed this fact. So the history of Muslims in America is, is incredibly diverse and reaches back far, far before what you might expect. Now, there's also documented uh, evidence that there were also Muslims with Columbus. When the United States got its independence against its own colonial master, the British, many countries around the world weren't quite sure what to do with this new, newly uh, independent country. Because remember, many European countries had their own colonies. And here was this newly freed colony, and, and they were a little nervous. And so I think it's important for every single person to know that the first nation state to recognize the United States of America as an independent republic was Morocco. Now, this, this is just to lay a groundwork to challenge the myth that there is an inherent and inevitable conflict that must exist between the so-called values of the United States and the values of Muslim societies or Muslim civilizations or Muslim communities. It is simply not supported by logic or history. And then the next Muslims that came to the United States were not brought here by choice. And that is a significant minority of enslaved Africans. The estimates range from 10 to 30 percent of enslaved Africans in the United States were Muslim. And I want to share with you the, a part of one story of one Muslim who was brought to Maryland from what is today Senegal forcefully. In fact, he was kidnapped. He wasn't even captured uh, as a prisoner of war. His name was Ayub bin Suleiman Diallo. And there are books written about this man. But I want to share one 
or two vignettes from his life that I find most inspirational. This was in the 1700s, and this man was kidnapped from his home. He was a part of a large scholarly family. This was a scholar of Islam, a man who had studied Arabic, a man who knew the Quran, a man whose father was a scholar, and brought to be a slave on a tobacco uh, plantation. And despite being in these harsh circumstances, despite being enslaved in this new land, in this, in this unknown place, imagine this and really reflect on this. He continued to make his salah. In fact, he would go to the woods sneak out into the woods during his work time in order to make Salah. Risking being punished, being beaten so he could pray. And when he could no longer pray, when he was being ridiculed and humiliated in his life as a slave in this plantation. He actually risked everything and ran away because he could no longer make the Salah. When he ran away, he ended up captured and in basically a courthouse. And what happened after that is a, many different sort of uh, coincidences and, and, and connections. But in the end, what led to his eventual freedom, because he was able to get his freedom, was his ability to read and write the Qur'an. This is a fact, this is a historical fact, and historians say that he literally wrote his way to freedom. That's a member of your ancestors in this country whose faith brought about his physical freedom because he refused to enslave his heart to anyone but Allah. Another story that many people uh, are not aware of is now from the 1800s. Now we've jumped 100 years. Now this is not a man who was in the United States, but he shaped American perceptions of Islam and Muslims. He is a man by the name of Abdul Qadir al-Jaziri. He was an Algerian commander and eventually ruler. In fact, he was eventually called Amir al-Mu'mineen. This man led the military resistance of the Algerian people in the 1800s against an invading French army. Now, before I go on, let us imagine today if there was someone doing that anywhere in the world, let's say in North Africa, a man leading a military campaign against an invading French army. What would our media call this man? I will let you fill in the blank. At that time, though, that's not how it was perceived at all. In fact, the press in America was incredibly sympathetic to the resistance to French colonialism in Algeria. He was so positively portrayed that until today, there is a town in Iowa called El Qadr, El Qadr, actually named after this man. The Americans saw this struggle perhaps as similar to their own struggle against colonial rule. There was a completely different frame by which Muslims and Islam was viewed. Again, testimony to the idea 
that this, this, the way things are today is not inevitable, it's not natural, it's not just the way it always has been. That's not the case. The way that Muslims and Islam is framed today is a deliberate, manufactured phenomena. It is not just how it is. It's not a natural, organic product of American uh, values. It's the opposite of American values. And so, one, so he was already, already his struggle against the French was, was seen as just. But then something else happened that was much, that was even more amazing. And, and earned him the respect of even his former colonial oppressors. And that is while he was in Damascus. Now listen very carefully what happens, and listen very carefully to where this happens. While he was in Syria, he and his private guards, not his army now, his, only his private guards, themselves single-handedly saved the lives of more than 10,000 Christians in, in Syria, in Damascus, from massacre at the hands of Druze rebels at that time in the 1800s. Not only did he save the lives of Christians in Damascus from massacre, but he defended the French consul from these rebels who were going to carry out violence against a civilian target of the French consul. Remember what he did for the first part of his life. These were his, his former oppressors, his former colonial invaders. And yet, as the history books have written, he understood the ethics of war before there was a Geneva Convention. Abdel Qadir was honored by Queen Victoria of England, by Napoleon III, the man who, who was fighting him earlier, and by our own president, Abraham Lincoln, at the time. And he gave him a gift of ceremonial guns. Imagine this. This is so wild. An American president honors a Muslim Essentially, he was a mujahid, a person who was fighting a just war against a, an invading army, honoring him with guns that are until today in the Algerian Museum. So challenge the paradigms that are being fed to our children and ourselves today. These are not natural things. These are not the way it's always been. There was a time when just struggles were seen as just struggles and they were recognized and such. And there was a time where Muslims' ethics of warfare and, and the way that they defended civilians was actually recognized. And yes, we have to take responsibility because there were Muslims acting out, living the values of Islam and they were recognized as such. Now, to bring us into the more modern age, one of my favorite American heroes is, has been called the greatest, Muhammad Ali, a man that stood by his convictions, losing everything and then later vindicated as an American hero. And we have a lesson to learn from this great hero, from this great patriot, from this great American. In February 25th, 1964, then Cassius Clay had a major match, a major fight with Sonny Liston and he had a chance at the heavyweight championship of the world. 
He was only 22 years old. And everyone was uh, betting against him. In fact, the odds were seven to one. He was the underdog in this fight. This is when he famously told Sonny Liston that he would float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. And he didn't disappoint. In what was called one of the greatest moments of sports history, he knocked out Liston in the seventh round, becoming the world champion of the world, the heavyweight champion of the world at the age of 22. The next day, this is, I, I didn't know this until very recently, so he was Cassius Clay when he won that title. One of, one of the greatest things to happen, one of the most exciting, exhilarating, and satisfying moments of sports history. The next day at the press conference, he, in Miami, Florida, and, and by the way, he was also being seen hanging out with a rebel rouser, troublemaker at the time named Malcolm X. And at that press conference that next day, he announced that he was a Muslim as he was talking about his title as the heavyweight champion of the world. And a few, a month, a few months later, he, he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. Now, several years later, he actually had to defend this title eight times, and he, he maintained that title as the heavyweight champion of the world. He was on top of the world, a young man at the prime of his career. And when he was drafted to join the military in the Vietnam War, a war that he disagreed with, a war that he objected to according to his values as a Muslim. And he refused to go. He said he cited religious justifications for not wanting to join the war. He was convicted of draft dodging, which he could have faced five years of prison he was fined $10,000, which in today's money would be more than 100000 And most painfully, he was stripped of his title and he was stripped of his license to box. Essentially, they took away his livelihood at the prime of his career. And he still didn't change his mind. He stuck by his values in the face of this kind of sacrifice. This kind of a hero a, a, and, and his position of being a dissident. Now at that time, he was called a draft dodger. He was spoken of terribly by the same people who were cheering for him in the ring. His popularity plummeted. No one no one wanted to see him, talk to him. He had to make money somehow. And so what he did is he became an activist. He actually went from university to university speaking out against the war. That's what he did when they took away his title. He became another kind of hero, another kind of champion, a champion for peace. Now that's where he started out, at the, at the height of his career, taken down, stripped of his title, his license taken away. And then public sentiment turned, and they realized, so many people realized that he was right, that the Vietnam War was a terrible mistake. And as public sentiment turned, his, his popularity grew now as an American dissident, an American hero, and a man of principle. But nothing changed in Muhammad Ali. It was the public that came around, not him who bent over. And let's keep that in mind as we feel the heat 
of that lack of popularity that he had to endure, and far, far worse. In 1970, the New York State Supreme Court gave him back his license to box. And then a year later, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned his conviction. No longer is it on his record that he was a draft dodger. And they did so unanimously. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court to bestow and to take away and to correct this mistake that they had made with this great American hero. And now look at Muhammad Ali. He has been named one of the 10 most influential Americans of all time. He was on the cover of Time Life as one of the, as the most recognizable American in the last century. He is now an ambassador of peace with the UN, recognized globally as an American hero and a hero of principle. You know, it's so interesting. A few weeks ago, President Obama gave a speech where he mentioned American Muslim athletes. And when he said that, now throughout the speech, he was mentioning Muslims in America in different ways. And Google, the Google search that was going with that was mostly like, kill Muslims, ban Muslims. That was what people were searching. When he said the thing about Muslim athlete, that suddenly became the top thing people were searching on, on Google, and it remained the top Google search for an entire day. Muhammad Ali is today seen, even by people who aren't so sure about Islam and Muslims, as an American hero, yet he started out as someone who was shamed, who was, who was stripped of his title, take, having, to, everything taken away from him, but sticking by his principles brought about this fat from Allah. And we have to take this lesson to heart today. Now I'm out of time, but these same American heroes exist today and they're right here in this room. We have teachers, firefighters, doctors, engineers. We have congressmen. We have people who are in the streets fighting for justice for all Americans. So don't let anyone ever make you feel that you are harmful to this country or even that you are simply just harmless to this country. American Muslims, like every American, are critical to American progress. Thank you.